So friends, it is an honor to welcome tonight Reverend Dr. Yvette Flunder. Uh, Reverend Dr. Flunder has served her call through prophetic action and ministry for justice for over 30 years. This call to blend proclamation, worship, service, and advocacy on behalf of the most marginalized in church and society led to the founding of the City of Refuge United Church of Christ in 1991. In 2003, Reverend Dr. Flunder was named Consecrated Presiding Bishop of the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries, which is a multi-denominational coalition of over 100 primarily African-American Christian leaders and laity. Reverend Dr. Flunder is on the board of Star King School for, the, for Ministry and Demos, 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 and has taught the world over. She's a graduate of uh, the Certificate of Ministry and Master of Arts programs at Pacific School of Religion and received her Doctor of Ministry from San Francisco Theological Seminary. She served as a member of the Presidential Advisory Council on HIV AIDS. She is also an award-winning gospel music artist and author of Where the Edge Gathers, a, Theo a Theology of Homiletic and Radical Inclusion. And Bishop Flunder shares her life with her partner of 34 years, Shirley. They have two daughters, and those two daughters have two sons. And Bishop Flunder travels for half of the year. And so we give thanks for the way in which her family gives her this space to be able to come and do this work in rooms like this with people like you. She is a much lauded and sought after preacher and speaker. And we are so lucky that she is here tonight. So yeah, you can totally clap for that. It's been one of the most um, life-affirming things that I've experienced to hear Bishop Flunder preach and teach um, at several different events that I go to throughout the year, and it's just a thrill to have her here. So friends, would you help me in welcoming Bishop Yvette Flunder? not tall. <laughs> but I, I tell my folks all the time, remember Jesus said, lo, I am with you all. <laughs> it works pretty good. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. What a joy to see you. Some faces that I know well from some of the situations and circumstances and events that we have shared together. Some of you are meeting, most of you, for the first time but it's with joy that I'm here. We persevered because the weather is complicated right now. I mean, you just don't know, right? You have to lay out several different choices of clothing because you just don't know. And imagine being born and raised in California. And I have been to DC and I've been to Chicago and you know, the snow and ice business is quiet. It creeps up on you. You're in your hotel, you can't hear it. I went, <laughs> I went to bed and the parking lot looked like a regular parking lot. I got up in the morning <laughs> and the cars were just white bumps all over. I said, what in the world happened? At least in California, you can hear things. You know, it rains, you can hear it. But it has been an amazing season because in this season, I have spent a great deal of time with uh, institutions of theological training and learning. And we are in a complicated time, an interesting time. And I'll say that with all of the various um, otherness that I embody in this room. Uh, as a woman, as a mother, 
as a spouse, as a spouse of a woman, as a person of African descent and Native American descent, and as a person who is same gender loving with no apology at all. That was a complete statement with no <laughs> apology at all. In fact, I've reached that point in my life and journey where I am extremely grateful to God for my otherness. And each of those realities are in some ways challenged by the time in which we live. But I must say that simultaneously, I am meeting with and sharing with some of the most incredible people on the planet, like yourselves, who believe that justice is not for just us, but that justice must run down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. So I wanted to share a little bit, and then we have a couple of questions, and I think that we're going to be able to have some dialogue with one another. I need to know about that. What is that that we're not having and that we're having in its place? The fountain of something is not and then some sweet something else is happening in this place. I hope to know more during the intermission about what, <laughs> about what that is. You're right. And so there were a couple of questions that I was asked to share. I want to thank God also for Pastor Liz. She's just an incredible pastor. She has a pastor's heart. I think uh, pe people say that pastors must be trained to be pastors, and I said that in my belief, and this doesn't fly as well as it possibly could in the church where I am also ordained in the United Church of Christ, I believe that pastors are called. And I believe that the called person can be trained. But I've seen a lot of people trained who were not called. And it just didn't work out. Do you understand what I'm saying? You have a pastor. And she has the heart of a pastor. And I thank God for you, Pastor Leo. You are an incredible leader with a beautiful heart for leadership. A beautiful heart for leadership. All right. So let me say uh, why I suggested these questions. The first one was a question of, in this atmosphere, as a person who understands marginalization and otherness, particularly around communities of faith. And I must say that religion in itself has a great tendency of dividing much more than creating community. Two sins of religion, one that I think are paramount. One is what I call absolutism. The other I call authoritarianism. And I'm adding a little one because of some of the current atmosphere that I call elitism. And the reason that I say what I've said about religion is because what should be bringing us together is often the thing that most divides us. This is our faith. And our faith should make room and space for everyone and anyone. There should be no Gentiles among us. There should be no margin too far. There should be no person among us who is vilified and demonized if we are likening ourselves to Jesus. Because that's not the way he rolled in the world. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but absolutism and authoritarianism and the way we talked about it today is very much like what happens at the annual interfaith service, where we just tolerate each other. You understand what I'm saying? It's like, oh God, oh, this thing is going to last for an hour. <laughs> Please, God. Because the Methodists don't particularly like the Lutherans, and the Lutherans don't particularly like the Episcopalians, and the Episcopal folks don't particularly think that the Catholics, who are their first cousins, they don't like them, and they're stuck. Like <laughs> and then there are those people, like the Jewish people and the Muslim people, and all of that mixed up together, and we'll play each other's songs and do each other's chants, and then head for the door and go back to the cultural environment that we are most comfortable in. Because where we are culturally comfortable, we often feel that is where we feel God. That's truth. 
And consequently, this idea of absolutism and authoritarianism walks together. What I believe is right. Why do I believe it? Because this is the way I was raised around it. Had I been born and raised in Islamabad, I would likely be a Muslim woman and I would likely be calling God Allah. I happen to have been raised in the black Pentecostal church that emerged out of Texas. That's why I talk like I do. I was born in San Francisco to a bunch of Texans. <laughs> and I eat grits. Everybody understand what I'm saying? Yes, and ham hocks. I'm feeling good now, just talking about it, right? Because that's who raised me. And I'm also acculturated in a way of worship and faith and belief connected to the people that I'm connected to. Why do I say that? Because absolutism and authoritarianism suggest that what I believe is closest to God's heart. And again, if there is a sin of religion, those are the sins of religion. Then if you add to that elitism, why elitism? Because then I have to be able to really figure out why my brand of it and my belief system around it is so much better than your brand of it and your belief. And even people who pro profess to be progressive can be elitist. There's such thing as progressive fundamentalism just like there is conservative fundamentalism. <laughs> and we progressives look down our nose. Come on now. Oh, it's okay, I'll say it. We look down our nose at people who think differently, oftentimes, than the way we think. So religion is filled with that. Now, if you add to that anyone who is not only theologically othered, racially othered, gender othered, if you add to that the realities of human sexuality othered, then that essentially creates another le level, another group of people that folks who have a need to really be right with God can say, like the man said, I may be so-and-so, but at least I'm not like him. Let me say it another way. The only way that we really can establish what is high is we have to establish what is low. Because high is not high by itself. High is only high in relationship to something else. So if I want to be high, I have got to find somebody that is low. And the consequence is, when we look around and find the people who may be the most othered among us, it is not complicated. Even when we have compassion to think in our hearts, well, I feel for you, but thank God I don't have that to deal with. <laughs> thank God that's not a part of my reality. Compassion even suggests that this is a person who needs something from me that they cannot really have for themselves. That's the reality of the human family. Now, how do we manage that in this time when the other, the simply most othered people currently politically and as it relates to religion right now in our time are the people who are at our borders, women who have the audacity to think that you can choose what happens with your own womb, and people who fall into the category of the non-binary, who are same gender loving, who are trans people, who are gender non-conforming, who don't fit comfortably, come on, with the furthest end of the spectrum, John Wayne, Marilyn Monroe, how am I doing with that? <laughs> who refuse to believe men are from Mars and women are from Venus. <laughs> okay, they're not, I just need to tell you that. We're all kind of from Pluto, I'm sorry. <laughs> that is not, we're not Mars and Venus, which I do know. So the heart of what I'm trying to say to you is that there has to be some way for us to expand away from the concepts of religion and faith, giving essentially power to disassociate from people who we consider other. Because that has not ever been God's intent. Now I'll tell you where we got it from. 
From the reading of the text, because all of us basically are impacted by the Hebrew Bible, by the New Testament, Old Testament, it is the story of a people, am I right? Who are God's favorites in some way. Okay? And, and when it moves from the Hebrew Bible to the New Testament, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, they were to ex accept the Messiah come in flesh, in fleshed in Jesus, the Christ, the Isa in Jesus. And, if, and because they did not accept, then there came a contingency plan. How am I doing with that? <laughs> we came for you, but you, his own, received them not. And then so we were grafted. You know that word that Paul used often? We were grafted in because the chosen ones would not receive it. So it sounds like God has levels. How am I doing with that? Of acceptance. They are the people who are really all right. Then there are the people that are kind of all right. And then there are the people that we just kind of pity, but we make room for them. How, how's that? Strata. Come on now. Oh, is that all right? And it impacts everything. The reason, because it's got an a, a echo. Turn it down just a little bit. Okay. Can you, can you hear me? Okay. I got one of those big Pentecostal voices. So, I can. so it impacts everything. How's that? Everything. So this exceptionalism is really a part of religion. It impacts race. It impacts essentially nationalism. It impacts where we live. It impacts how we vote. It impacts the schools we go to. Because it's one thing essentially to feel sorry for people or to empathize with people, but it's yet another to have them as neighbors. How's that? <laughs> Say, oh, I feel so sorry for them. Say, well, well, they're moving into you next door. Uh-oh. <laughs> Say, we weren't exactly talking about that. We weren't talking about that. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you something funny. In the Hamptons, in New York area, which is where some of the most wealthy families in, on the East Coast have moved to, that up in New York. You all know what I'm talking about, the Hamptons in, in New York. You can only live in the Hamptons if you had a certain amount of money, right? And so as a person of African descent, as an African-American, the progeny of slaves up from Texas, that's where my folks were, Texas and Oklahoma. I can say that I didn't aspire to moving into the Hamptons. I never thought really actually that most of my kin folks and family and folks who look like me would have houses in the Hamptons. And neither did the people in the Hamptons. <laughs> but along came Jay-Z and Beyonce. <laughs> and along came the basketball players. How am I doing with that? And, and 50 Cent. <laughs> and so here you are with an old family in the Hamptons. How's that? And then late at night, you hear somebody rolling up. Boom, 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 boom. So the question is, oh my God. There's Jay-Z and his posse. Because <laughs> they got a place right up here. In fact, their place costs twice as much as your place. And the only thing left to do is jump off a cliff because you're always at the end of the Hamptons. And the frustration is not so much that these are folks that didn't love Jay-Z. They just didn't expect Jay-Z was ever going to actually move in. Not so much that the church does not seek to broaden itself in the acceptance of LGBT people and do so sometimes with pity and a heart for generosity. But we're not talking about LGBT people as pastors and leaders, come on now, and parents and public officials. We're, we're, not talking about, we're not quite talking about that in a lot of places. People to be cared for, to be pitied, to be a symbol of our bigness, 
to demonstrate to the world that we are seeking to be kind and generous, but in reality, we can see people pass by and say, well, thank God for the grace of God, that is not my reality. Because there is still connected to it what it really means to be high in comparison to what is low. We are healed when being same gender loving becomes a non-issue. Hallelujah. I've had a Pentecostal moment just right this way. <laughs> When it becomes a non-issue, what do I mean by a non-issue? When it becomes such an integral part of the quilt of who we all are together in our many different ways of being other, when that happens to us, then I believe we will have connected such that this is a part of our family and not essentially an outreach program. How am I doing with that? <laughs> Full integration. I am your sister. Let's be clear. I am your sister of a darker hue for many of you, but I am your sister. And I claim you as my siblings and my family of choice. It is my decision. Now, I was raised on chitlins. I don't expect you to understand chitlins. Some of you are looking at me, you don't have it yet. You're looking at me because you've never had a chit in your life. <laughs> but I was raised on chitlins and pig feet. Souse, come on, and pig ears and all of that. Low on the hog because that's what my folks had to do. And they made a delicacy of roadside greens. Come on now that grow now and they're all in the markets and Whole Foods got collard greens and mustard greens. And they were weeds when I was coming along, right? <laughs> and I can't explain chitlins to you in a way that would make it okay. I just want to say that. <laughs> Let me tell you something else. You don't come into chitlins late in life. <laughs> you had to be raised on chitlins. But I also don't get haggis. I don't get it. Blood sausage. I don't get it. Kimchi. I can't even get close to kimchi. I get in proximity to it. And then I, I break and run almost. It's like, what died? What is that? What is? Because I have my heritage. You have your heritage. There's something that your grandma cooked that a lot of us haven't had. There's some things that my grandma cooked that a lot of you have not had. But please understand that by choice, I am your sister fully and completely, even in my otherness. Why? Because everybody in this house has some otherness. Some of us have just been able to hide ours. Some otherness is visible. We can see it. We know it. We're a part of a group of people that perhaps a group of people think less of, and we may be in a, a minority as versus a majority voice, but all of us have some otherness. Hallelujah. Every last one of us has something about us in our families, on our job, some reality that constitutes our otherness, but all of us are the family of God. So, it begs a question for me. And the question is, does, when you take a good look at the lay of the land, and, and, and let me just say that in our current atmosphere, I believe that particularly evangelical Christianity, but also some realities of Christianity, we have abdicated in many ways what I believe is our moral authority. And somebody asked me, why would I make such a strong statement? And I said to them, I said, because we have called good evil and evil good. And let me say it another way, the way it would be said in the Pentecostal churches that raised me. You, don't, you cannot lay down with the devil and get up clean. Now that's very Pentecostal, what I just said. It's like a, just so you know, some of you all who may have been raised in the those kinds of environments, that there's certain kinds of ways that we cannot abdicate the law of love. 
in the law of peace in order to be politically correct. And what is really showing up is our desire to be exceptional. And when I say our, I am talking about the current marketplace voice of Christianity in our country right now. Something is very wrong. Something is very wrong. And I want to be one of those voices that say, well, just let people be people. No, something is very wrong in this present atmosphere with some of the ways in which people say they are representing Jesus. You cannot, you simply cannot forget your responsibility to the earth. You cannot. You cannot forget responsibility to the poor. We cannot. We cannot forget what it is that we are called to do and who God is. We cannot do that in order to do church as big business. That was good what I just said. Choreograph church as big business. Something is problematic about that. So set that aside for a minute. And I have had to ask myself this question and I want you to ask yourself. Is your faith, your understanding of God, your faith disillusioned when you realize that religion right now is embroiled in things that are wrong? What does that do to your faith. Now, I ask that question because I work with a lot of young adults and millennials. What comes after millennials? Busters? Boom. <laughs> it's just another name for the folks that are younger than millennials. What is that? Generation I. Okay, I'm a, I'm a, a baby boomer. <laughs> I qualify for Social Security. <laughs> and I got mine. I want you to know that because... <laughs> I do not trust Congress with my money. I want you to know that. So, so here's what I'm saying to you. you. Many of you, like many of my folks who are younger than me and some same age as me and older than me, are somewhat disillusioned because they are having some difficulty with what we are doing in the name of God in this current time. So my question is, is your faith disillusioned when religion is wrong? And if it is disillusioned, what is it that is the world that we dream would exist? If you could change it, what would it look like? And somehow or other, we're gonna have to have that conversation with one another. Now, I'm of the opinion that church in the time of Jesus was not theater style, where everybody has to look at me. I'm of the opinion that they had a whole lot more opportunity to share with one another in some ways. So I would like to hope, Pastor, that we can come up with a way and a process that we can talk amongst ourselves and vision and dream what would our gathering congregationally look like if we could do with it what we really feel led to do. How would we impact not only our church, this campus opportunity and this powerful congregation, but how would we impact the body of Christ, the church everywhere, if we could shift it and change it? What would, what would it be like? How about that for exciting? <laughs> and just imagine if what we do in this gathering and what we say in this gathering could contagiously catch fire. How about that? and shift and change from a conversation tonight. It takes about this many people to change the whole world. Let me say it again, about this many people can change the whole world, because love is contagious. So I would love to know, and so tell us, Pastor, how do we, how shall we, can we group up? Because there are ways that we can chat, or yeah. shall we ask the questions and have people come and, give comments or how shall we do Would you take the next, I'm going to time you, four minutes, turn to your neighbor mm -hmm. and have that conversation. Will you repeat the question for us again? Okay, the question is, is your faith disillusioned when Christians or religions are wrong? Mm. That's the, the A part of it. The B part of it is, and if you could shift or change it, what would you do? Mm. 
What would you do or what would you love to see done? Is that good? Yes. Tell, talk to somebody. The questions are, is your faith disillusioned when Christians or religion are wrong? And the second half of that is, what would you shift and change if you were able to essentially impact religion as it is for us now? Shift, change, get rid of, keep, what would you do? Those are the questions. So somebody's got to talk to us. So, so my church people are used to this kind of question and answer thing. <laughs> Somebody? Here we go. I'm gonna hold your microphone. Our little quartet agreed that we are so used to ignoring the right wing that it doesn't change that they continue to be crazier and crazier. We've ignored them for a long time and it doesn't change our faith. So we got that far in the conversation. Mm -hmm. We couldn't figure out the next step, but we recognized that we were participating in this thing called echo chamber. Mm -hmm. We of course are very critical of <laughs> folks who only listen to Fox News. I won't mention who that would be because they only hear their own ideas echoed back to them, but we kind of do that too. Mm -hmm. Somebody else. Um, I, I believe that when I was younger and I would look at churches, it was so forceful and so aggressive in how hard they pursued to make you understand what was going on and you know how you should believe and how you should you know practice religion. You know, but you know. We would hear it's less forceful and more just a space where you can understand it and it's less, you know, you have to do it this way. You know, it has to be this way. And then I think, you know, that's how it should be. It, sh it shouldn't be so in one path, where, you know, this is the only right way to do it. And that's just how I see it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So hi there. I'm from Ken's group. Um, one of the things that I was just thinking about in my head uh, when thinking about uh, Dr. Flunder, some of the things that you were saying, was perhaps having not only conversations that are internal within a church and making the space of church more dynamic, but perhaps preachers or um, kind of religious leaders have those conversations within themselves to think about churches visiting other churches and having that being that ethic of the church that's annually, that isn't just like, oh, we did it, we cleaned our hands with it, but something that's built within the, um, the continuity of this is the way our church practice, practices love, practices conversation, practices forgiveness, and things of that nature. Yes. So, just a thought. Thank you. One of the things we talked about a minute ago was church as silos. And you know how out in the field where the silos of corn, silos of wheat, and you can stand and you can look at a group of silos. You don't know what's inside of them because <laughs> they've got whatever that is that was put inside of them, inside of them. And I've watched it. I've been in South Side Chicago where it's 15 churches on the same block and they have longer and longer names. <laughs> Church of the Holy Spirit of God in Christ, the kingdom is coming again. <laughs> Temple. <laughs> <laughs> and that's because they move three times, and every time they move, <laughs> they add it to the name, you know. <laughs> and they're right next door to, you know, First Baptist, you know, and, and, and they share a wall, and they do not know each other. It's amazing to me how siloed we can be. So your point is, very, all the points are very well taken. We, we see the issue but we are given to finding comfort zones. And, and Sunday at 11 o'clock, thereabouts, is the most segregated hour of the week because people are drawn to something that is not simply Christ or God or spirit. They are drawn to something else. So my honest confession 
is that I clap on the two and the four. I like a tambourine, a B3 organ, and a full drum set. Why? Because I'm raised in a Methabapticostal cultural environment. Do you understand? And it, all, it sounds holy, because that's what I'm used to. But what is it, so here's my dilemma and our dilemma. What do we have to break through for me to get right up on you and get you right up on me? So th this is what I have learned. I know I'm, I'm probably wrong, but hold, hold that for me. Come in. So he, here's, here's what I want to say. If I am going to, I'm going to mistreat you for a minute. If I'm going to objectify you, I'm going to stand over here. And I'm going to say, you know how they are. All of them are like that. I've seen tons of them. And they're all like that. And I, and I can do that as long as I'm over here, if you understand. And I can look across and say, well, at least I'm not that. Or I don't have to put, but it gets different if I can find a way to break out of my silo. Can, can you hear me without my microphone? If I can break out of my silo, and there's another way, right? Because in that embrace, what I was able to feel was their heartbeat and my heartbeat and their heartbeat. And something changes when we either literally or figuratively or honestly and authentically break through and get to each other. That's why the, such an important concept. First, to know that we need to do it. To your point, brother. We need to stop talking about it. And we need to do it. Now we have to design a way to do it. This that you did tonight, if we could repl replicate this, about 65,000 times, <laughs> we would be closer actually living there. So anyway, I have to try to do <laughs> But I hope you hear my heart. I hope you hear my heart. Okay, thank you, sister. That's brother. Would you, would you stay with that for just a second? Yes. And show us or tell us how institutions would do what you two just did? Oh, such an important question. How do we do it institutionally? It can get beyond this whole business of binary. You understand what I mean? The either or. I say that we study the either or God. We study the either or God as versus the both and God. We love the either or God. Either you're in or you're out. Either you're up or you're down. Either you're black or you're white. Either you're male or you're female. It's just, we don't have the concept of God as both and. And when we move that to the conversations about gender and sexuality, it becomes very complicated because it's like it's, you're male or you're female. And I told somebody the other day, I said, you know, in the telling of the story, whether you think it's literal or mythological, of the Garden of Eden, it suggests that Eve was made out of the rib of Adam, which suggested Adam had a whole woman in him. Mm. I'm just saying. <laughs> and somebody said, well, that was, you know, I said, well, what about, they said, well, what about Mary? I said, well, we suggest that Jesus was created behind the hymen. Grown people in the room, right? <laughs> right? Yes. Which also suggests that in Mary, was a whole man. Mm. Then I really get in trouble, if you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> what I'm saying is that all of us are both a hand. Is, is that all right? We've been either or by culture. Mm. We are both and. We are both and. We, we don't ever say that Barack was a white president. Mm. But we have just as much right to say that as we do that he was a black president. Mm. It's just that when you get that black, when you pour that black in there, just a little bit of it. <laughs> It'll do this to your hair, you know, <laughs> do this to your skin. But the, <laughs> the heart of it is we, have e we either or one another. So if we are going to shift, we're going to have to understand that there is no true binary. Mm. We just are. 
We're not this or that. We're not Republican or Democrat. We're not conservative or, 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 I hate it. <laughs> because some people who say they're liberals are not. Mm -hmm. Conservative or liberal. We are. We are. And that concept, we picked up that concept too from our reading many times of Holy Writ. Mm. You're in or you're out. And that's why you get these incredible dichotomies like the Ku Klux Klan, who is a Christian organization, a 501c3 religious organization, who uses the cross as their symbol, and they're deeply anti-Semitic. And I ask them, so Jesus was a Jew. Let's be clear. Jesus was never a Christian. Mm -hmm. I need that to sit there. He was a Palestinian Jew. Mm. How is it conceivable that you can hate all the Jewish people and love Jesus? How does that work? And how is it that you can be so filled with hatred, but your hatred is, is connected to the elitism of European white people? How is that conceivable? You, you picked up the religion of a Palestinian Jew who you hate but you use the cross. Isn't that a jumping up bunch of stuff? <laughs> but that's the kind of stuff we do when we either or ourselves. Mm. You're my brother. You're just my brother by another mother. Mm -hmm. But you're my brother because I choose you. I want you. And there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> okay? We're kin. When we move that way as the church, and as religion, we can break down the barriers. There is no such thing as either or. We are both and. And the more we homogenize, the more we will be able to do together. Start as a church, we need to do it as a nation. What, what are we trying to do? What is, the root, what is the root core of what we're trying to do with closing our borders? The fear is the browning of this country. Mm -hmm. That is the deep fear. It's a terror because there are certain assumptions about brown people. And, this, and it is the assumption, some of them are the assumptions of guilt that suggest that somehow or other, here they come and they're mad. <laughs> mm -hmm. And this is gonna be a problem, <laughs> you know? There's a reconciliation but there's no reconciliation without repentance. Mm -hmm. And our country has to own some of what we've done. Mm -hmm. We won't be exceptional until we get it right. <laughs> so that's a real part of what has to happen to your question. But can we do it? Of course we can do it. It begins with folks like us in this room. You all are in this room with a Cherokee, Igbo, and by the way, 12% of me is Irish. See what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I told them we were on the low end of the totem pole of the Europeans. It's a great day in the morning. <laughs> so I know we're probably at time, but let's, can we get a couple more? We have time? We have time for one more. One more, one more. Thank you, Pastor. Is there one more before we go get whatever that is that's sweet that's downstairs? <laughs> Anybody else? You good? Yes, Angel. Use her microphone. Sure. <laughs> so I, I was just thinking about this ideal of universalism, universal salvation through Jesus, uh, through his sacrifice uh, to make all righteous. And, and the concept of universalism is that we're all going to be in heaven together forever anyways. So if we can't learn how to... Uh, address uh, the Lord's Prayer to make heaven on earth now, we ha that's what we should be working towards, both within our churches and within society. Uh, to answer the first question about whether I feel disenfranchised from the church, um, I, I don't, uh, because the church has always been wrong in so many different ways. Um, in the moment that we uh, get to a point where we've done it and we think that we 
we've done it and, and uh, we've eradicated racism in our church or something along those lines, that it's that moment that we stop working towards, uh, towards holy. Um, so if we acknowledge that we're always going to be working towards it, um, that's just what we have to do. <laughs> what, you, what you have done, and I know we're at time, but what, what you have done is like my good friend Bishop Colin Pearson, who's been, been my friend for years and years. We were raised in the same church, you know, same denomination. And when people would say things like that, then immediately what people would do is default to hell. You know, you're going to hell. Just, if you disagree with me in any way, I have an apocalyptic eschatology for you. <laughs> You gonna blow up, <laughs> and like that's the end of the conversation. You gonna blow up, right? When when people were really afraid of hell, it was it worked. Mm. You know, we go all the way back to the Welsh revivals. You know, let's go all the way back to the to, to the things we could say around the bubonic and pneumonic plague and how big revivals broke out when when there was sickness and death, right? That you that you go into hell, but when people start. Becoming people of spirit mm. and not people of religion. Mm. I hope you hear me. Yeah. And I hope your hearts and your spirits and ours connect today. People of spirit and not people of religion. God doesn't do love, God is love. Mm. Mm. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He or she that loves not, knows not God. For God is love, is perfect love, is. And when you are, then you do love. God is love. And that's our reality. Well, then that got us kind of away from the apocalyptic God, vengeful God, which is driving the church nuts. Because <laughs> we don't have anywhere to send all you apostates. <laughs> Loose living bunch of <laughs> liberals. Because <laughs> when we had hell, we had something for you. <laughs> so we'll do is we'll send you to hell. And now you clap back, you get tickled. You say, oh, baby, I'm not going to hell, darling. You have to bring something else. If you understand what I'm saying, we're just going to throw everything off, right? So my heart says that we need to begin, and you all touched it beautifully tonight, what we need to begin to do is talk about how do we now frame something other than just liberal concepts of religion, but how do we really become relational such that some of these folks that are preaching all of this kind of hateful stuff will turn toward this because this is a better way. Mm. What a beautiful congregation you are. You would probably be where I'd go to church if I was in this area. <laughs> what a beautiful group of people you are. What a better way this is. And for LGBT people who have been so severely marginalized, and I can say that because there were churches that were predominantly white in the South that received people coming out of slavery who were marginalized and they made them full members. I can say that as the same gender-loving woman who has a responsibility for a number of other churches. As I see people coming out and fully affirmed, I thank God because there had to be right-thinking white people who voted black people into the ability to vote. Mm. There had to be right-thinking men who voted women into the ability mm. to vote. Does anybody understand that? that the, the freedom of the minority is connected to the liberation of the majority. Mm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's why we got to get free, because only free people can free people. We got another question when we come back. God bless. So I wanted to talk just a little bit. Can you hear me well now? Yeah. All right. Talk just a little bit about um, my journey. I spoke to you some about some of what informs me theologically, politically, but I think it's important to talk about my own coming out experience because my coming out experience, uh, particularly in the really super theologically conservative environment that I was raised in, may touch someone else's current experience. 
it included church, but of course it also included family. And the question that we're going to talk about just for a minute or two uh, at the end of this is the question of what is the difference between uh, Christian culture and Christian religion? How, how are they different, or Christian faith? And we touched on it a minute ago, but I was in the womb of the Pentecostal church, uh, what might best be described as a, a high-born Church of God in Christ person. I have three uh, male uh, members of my family who are bishops in the Church of God in Christ, which is the largest African-American Pentecostal movement. In fact, it may be the largest African-American denomination, period. It's got a gazillion, quadrillion people all over the United States and world. The Church of God in Christ, founded out of the Azusa Street Mission in 1906 uh, by Bishop Charles Harrison Mason. And my truth is that my coming out was threefold. First of all, because I sensed myself to be a woman with what was called then a full charge of ministry. I sort of knew I was a pastor <laughs> way long before I knew what it was. And I got engaged in doing some work around theological education before I got into theological education. Uh, I, I want to carefully use the word professionally. But in terms of my training, my going to school and spending some time uh, unpacking all of the German writers, you all understand what I mean, and doing the work for systematic theological training, I sensed myself to be a pastor. I was one of those little kids that when I went outside and sat down on the curb, four or five other little kids would sit down on the curb with me. And they'd say, what you doing? And I'd say, well, let's do this. They'd say, okay. <laughs> do you understand what I'm talking about? It's the, the charismata, you know, the, 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 the desire to, to be in community and to care for people. And so my first departure was when I realized that I simply could not do that in the denomination that I was in because it did not believe in women having a full charge of ministry in that way. The next thing was when I knew myself called to social justice work. Because again, we had what was definitively an apocalyptic eschatology. We didn't even vote. Why vote? Jesus is coming on Friday. Why would we vote? We believe that not only was Jesus coming on Friday, but Jesus was coming to blow everything up. So why care for the earth? You, do you understand? Why would we try to work for clean water? if it's all going to be blown up, which is still a bit of a paradox for a lot of people who believe in the destruction of the earth, right? And let me take it aside. I started having some of the same kind of issues about that um, as, as the conversation that I heard an, a reporter have with one of the teachers at Bob Jones University. This particular teacher was teaching a class to go to Arab countries and to preach Christ. And they were teaching them the language, had them dressing in the clothes so that they would go to Arab countries and, and preach Christ. And he asked the question of the teacher, why are you doing that? And so the teacher said, because Maranatha, anybody go back that far, you know what I'm talking about. If, if we don't preach Christ, then the return of the Lord will not be expedited. So essentially we have to preach Christ and bathe the world in teaching Christ, and then the Lord will come, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, okay? And so the guy said, well, what if you miss some people? <laughs> this is the reporter, that while you're preaching Christ, and they never get the message, then the teacher said, well, people are only going to be held accountable for what they have learned about God. Essentially, you'll only be held accountable for as much God as has been to you which the reporter said, which is what I was thinking in my heart, then why go? <laughs> if they can get into heaven with what they got, why are we bombing them, right? <laughs> so 
so then the reporter cut, you know what I mean? Everything, everything went off. <laughs> and so I started asking those same questions to myself. You know, um, why is it, as we said earlier, if, if, a, if a Muslim mother is praying to God to bring her son or daughter home from the war, and a Christian U.S. mother is praying for God to bring her son or daughter home from the war, why would God hear one of them and not the other? Why is, why is it that we have this need to make small of or to debase other people's understandings of God, and God by any name, any other name, is still God if the concept of understanding the divine is there, right? So that, that was a real issue for me, and it started to become an issue. So this second departure about social justice was huge. It was massive because I started feeling like my sphere is too small, and I need to be able to reach out, and I need to be able to expand. And I believe that God is not petty, how about that? And punitive, and always angry. Sort of like the pantheon of the Catholic Church where God is just distant, you understand what I mean? Off somewhere, mostly pissed. <laughs> and Mary is the heart of God and she's mostly crying. She's crying, every time I look she's just weeping. <laughs> and then Jesus is this errant son of theirs who goes out and gets himself killed. And then he's on her lap and she's weeping and he's dying, and you can't find the father anywhere. That's basically, I said, so what is that? And what is that understanding of God? And is that my understanding? And I felt myself, I'm not a Mary type. You know what I'm saying? I just can't be sitting somewhere crying all the time. I <laughs> I'm not a woman for that, if you understand what I'm saying. So, so I, knew, I knew that justice was important and I needed to get out there and fight for it. Either fight for it or spend all of my life being or feeling less than. It became extremely important to me. And then finally, when I sensed myself to be a same gender loving woman, I was very young, I was probably 14 or 15 years old. And I did all the things that you try to do when you're in a very conservative environment. I tried to get myself straight, you know? I just went through all kind of things. And I mean, I was sincere about it. I'd go on these long fasts. I'd fast for seven days and 20 days. And I remember the long I was on was 40 days. That's a long time. So, you know, all I had was juice and water because I was trying to get this thing out of me. And I knew it was in me because being same gender loving is not what I did, it's what I felt. It wasn't an action, it was a being. And it was frustrating as heck because I couldn't unbe. So I asked myself one day, I said, so what kind of God would do this to somebody? That if this is so against God's will, that would be so, sort of like God making me or allowing me to be a person of African descent. And I think that the only thing beautiful is to be white. But I'm stuck because this is what I am, right? It, it's, it's more like that than anything that I can think of. And I remember this as a teenager. I remember this as a young adult. And I have never really been all the way on one line or the other. Let me, let me, let me put it this way, because I may have some witnesses in the house, just so I can just kind of contextualize this for you. They had bars when I was coming along a lot. These were the hangouts. These were the social churches for gay people. I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> With music and dance, people brought tambourines and whistles and just carried on, something terrible. And in the, in the, women's, in the women's clubs, they had a room that was for the womenly women. <laughs> and they had a room that was kind of for the manlyish women, where they had the sports on the screens. And then over here, the women would talk about recipes. 
Anybody follow me? Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. And they would be sitting together at tables and chatting and drinking pretty drinks. And then over here, they would have beers. So we could be clear, this is the manly women and this is the womanly women. Well, I would be standing in the middle going like this. It's like, good God from heaven. So I really don't do football. I can cook, but I don't want to exchange recipes. And what am I supposed to do? I'm a hallway lesbian, if you understand what I'm saying. Okay, just so you understand what I'm saying. I think somebody understands where I am with that, okay? <laughs> so anyway, there I am in the hallway. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> Trying to figure out what the heck am I supposed to do? So I'm the person that will fry your chicken and I've had three motorcycles. So maybe that'll give you some idea. So, so the, the real question of where do you fit became problematic for me because I also knew myself called by God to do the work of ministry. I've known it since I was a very young person. It was very clear in dreams, I know somebody knows, in visions, the manifestation of uh, the power of God in my life. I've always known myself to be a spirit person and a spirit-oriented person. And I, I just couldn't figure out how to get it all reconciled. And so I started talking about it, and then not long after that, I started feeling that hand that was pushing me away. And I'm gonna tell you something else. I was not alone. The church that I was raised in had a good complement of same gender loving people. All on the down low, but we knew each other. All of us knew each other. And it was a significant network of us. A significant network. And we kept each other's secrets because we needed the safety of each other's secrets. But we knew each other. We also knew who were the people who were preaching against us and were us. And let me go a little further and say to you that everything that, uh, just about that I learned about human sexuality, I learned it in the church. In fact, the church people were a lot more busy. Because <laughs> you know people like the dark, if you understand what I'm saying. It just, it, it, no, it's titillating. You know, to sit right next to somebody you've been with last night and act like you don't know them. It was amazing. I, the stories I could tell you, because I knew everybody. You understand what I'm saying? It's just the network was pretty robust. <laughs> so, so there came a time when I had to ask a fundamental question. There's somebody besides me that understands this fundamental question. How is it that I can reconcile these realities that I am both called by God and I am a same gender loving woman without question. I am called by God. And I am a same gender loving woman at the same time. And I had to come where the rubber meets the road on that. And I actually said to God one day, why would you call me and require me to lie? I do not understand that. What kind of God would do something like that to someone? What, what, how can you be God and do something like that? So you're gonna change me or you're gonna have to use me as I am. And I fasted and prayed and fasted and prayed some more until one day when I was in prayer, I heard what was almost like an audible voice that spoke into my spirit and said that this is an issue for you, it is not an issue for me. But it changed my whole life. I said, okay, I got up. I said, I'm gonna go after it. I'm going to pursue ministry. I'm gonna do the work. And if God goes with me, I'll go, right? I started in that direction. Next order of business was to talk to my mama. Oh, Lord, I tell you. And it's not like she didn't know. She just wouldn't talk about it. Mothers always know, in case anybody wonders. Sometimes your daddy's are kind of clueless, but your mother, <laughs> the one that you were attached to, do you understand what I'm saying? And, and, and the one, whether she's your birth mother or not, the one that really was the, that kind of nurturer in your life. Mothers know, 
My mother knew. She just figured that if we didn't talk about it, it wouldn't make it real. And she also did not want me to ever actually say it because then she would have to respond in ways that she didn't want to respond. So finally, we got distant from each other for a few years, me and mama. About maybe five or six years, we called each other only occasionally. And when we did, our conversations were very difficult, very terse and um, judgmental. Uh, I think she was hoping to shame me enough so that I would get it together. And uh, she was waiting for me to get delivered and she was praying and fasting and crying before God and asking God to set me free. And so I called her one day because I felt led. And I said, so mama, how you doing? It was on a Monday. So she gave me dust. She said, fine. That's the way she said it. I said, well, good. <laughs> <laughs> I said, um, so I'm coming over to your house to pick you up. She said, for what? I said, I want to take you shopping. Pause, 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 pause. She said, shopping? See, I knew my mother. See, some of you all don't, don't know, I knew my mother. Off Fifth, Nordstrom's Rack, okay? Last Call, Neiman Marcus. I knew my mother. My mother was a shopaholic, I knew her. I said, I'm, I'm coming to pick you up, take you shopping. Shopping? She said, where are we going? And I told her where. She said, what time are you coming? <laughs> so, got in the car. <laughs> Went over to get my mother. Why? Because I wanted my mother back. Does anybody understand? And I had to find a way. I had to find a way to mother my mother. That's a part of freedom. Because sometimes we have to mother our parents. We have to father our parents. Because this is hard, right? So I called my mother and set up a time. I went over and picked my mother up. She was silent in the car. Most of the time we were driving. We went out to the places where we went. I was carrying all our stuff because I, because <laughs> that's what I had to do to carry our stuff. I bought some of the stuff for her. I said, Mama, let me get that for you. I'm going to pick that up for you. You going to get this for me? I said, yeah, let me get that. I'm going to get you two of them. And so we, we were get, carrying bags. Finally, maybe four or five times we did that on Mondays. My mother started talking to me. She said, I just don't understand it, Yvette. She said, all I really understand is holes and poles. I need you to think about that for a minute. I said, what, mama? <laughs> <laughs> holes and poles. She said, what do gay people do? This is what my mother said to me. I said, we can't talk about that. I said, what? She said, oh yeah, we're gonna have to talk about that. That's what she told me. My mother, my mother said this to me. So I said, okay, holes and poles. So we started talking. Then we started talking theologically. We started talking anatomically. We started talking chromosomally. We started talking about the reality of the existence of same gender loving people having predated any of this conversation that these people are going back and forth. And religiously, we've been talking about this a long time because this is a part of human reality, right? Talked about other relationships uh, to this reality and indigenous African tribes and indigenous Native American tribes. And we just went on and on and on. So my mother said to me, she said, shut up, Yvette. <laughs> she said, stop talking. So I stopped talking. Then she picked it up again. She said, because if what you are saying is true, she said, I've been 60 years of my life believing something that I didn't have to believe. She said, and do you understand that that makes me feel like a fool? And I told her, I said, Mama, you just put your finger right on it. It is hard to believe something that you haven't experienced, particularly all of your life, and then to have somebody come along and tell you that it's different. It's hard to hear that. But my mother, when she was married to my birth father, 
My father had PTSD and he could be physically abusive. My mother divorced my birth father in a conservative church that said that if you divorce your husband and he is still living, you cannot marry again. And my grandfather, who was our pastor, broke the law. Anybody understand what I'm saying? And allowed my mother and my stepfather to get married. They were married for 52 years when my father and my mother died. And people got mad at my grandfather, but my grandfather found a better way. Hallelujah. Love is a better way. Now my mother was faced with trying to figure out how she was going to receive me. And she was looking for a better way. And we realized something about the way that people read the Bible. If you want to hate somebody, there's something in there for you. If you want some slaves, there's something in there for you. If you, want, <laughs> if you want to belittle women, there's something in there for you. If you want American exceptionalism, nationalism, there's something in there for you. There's something in there for you. It's in there. If you just put a few scriptures together and hang them together and hook it up, <laughs> you can find some biblical defense for just about every kind of anything that you want. <laughs> I call it cherry picking, proof texting doing what you need to do, visiting the Bible with an already preconceived notion of what you want God to say. But there's also, hallelujah, words about love and acceptance. And I declare that they are the stronger word because God is love. There's no question about that. Apolitical and full of love. And my mother, was doing for me what her father did for her. She was looking for a way to set me free. Because what my mother realized is that if she could set me free, then my mother could set herself free. So she didn't talk to me for about three weeks after one of our big shopping trips. Especially that one that I'm telling you about now, the holes and poles ones I'm talking about. So, so she, she called me. Uh, you know, but she didn't, wouldn't see me. Early one morning, ding, 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 my doorbell was ringing. I told Shirley, that's mama, because she lays on the doorbell. Ding, 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 Nobody does this but mama. Ding, 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 ding. So I got up and I went downstairs and my dog was barking and it was just a big thing, you know. I opened the door. Now, you have to understand, my mother was a Pentecostal woman. Okay, so she, she wore long, long dresses, no, no pants, no makeup. You understand what I mean? Just, just, she, she was a good, great dresser among the people that she dressed with, but it was a whole total different kind of thing because we believe that most everybody else was going to hell. Let me see if anybody in here is right. <laughs> everybody over here is going to hell. Let me look over here. <laughs> I think for the most part, I'm looking for somebody. No, not a one of you. There's something's wrong with everything. There's the hair, the clothes, the everything. It's wrong. So, um, my mother was at my front door when I opened the door. And she was standing kind of like this. And she had on a J-Lo pantsuit. <laughs> with a cap on with sequins all around it. <laughs> These tennis shoes that had jewelry, jewelry bobs on them. So you know what I'm talking about, stuff you attach to your tennis shoes to my mother. <laughs> and I was standing at the door, I said, Mama? <laughs> she said, yes. <laughs> she said, it's me. <laughs> she said, and I came by to tell you something. <laughs> I said, well, what? She said, I'm free. <laughs> it changed our whole relationship. And you want to know how deeply it changed? My mother ended up leaving the denomination that I was raised in. She connected with our fellowship. And early in the morning, every day, when we have our convocations, my mother would be the one who would get up and start prayer. Eight o'clock, 8.30 in the morning. I can not hard for me to even talk about it because it makes me a little verklempt. But she would uh, start prayer in the morning. 
And she'd have us all in prayer, all the preachers, all the leaders, all the auxiliary and department heads. We'd be on our knees or sitting on the pews in the chairs and in prayer. My mother was the one that prayed us into existence as the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries some 22, 23 years ago. That same mother, she was our preacher, she was our counselor, she loved Shirley, my Shirley. And they had these private conversations and they wouldn't tell me. <laughs> I couldn't get them to tell me. She reached out to other parents and they had their own gathering, their own workshop. And they'd shut the door and they would talk about it, about how they were going to manage. Because whenever we come out, we bring our parents out by accident because their community begins to think less of them as though they somehow didn't raise us right. You understand? And so they talked to each other and they strengthened each other and then they allowed us to understand their pain. Did you understand? Because that's an important part of it. We got together, we did our circle dance together. So I want to say to you that my mother's been translated she graduated, as I called it, into the presence of God since 2007. But she's closer to me now than she was when she was on terra firma. First of all, I see her in the mirror all the time. I just, <laughs> I see her in the morning, I say, hi, mom. <laughs> because I can see her face at this age in ways that I couldn't when I was younger, but I must say that she still very much informs my faith. I thank God for my mother and for her journey, her coming out experience. And I want to say to all of you who are mothers, or those of you that have mothers and fathers, and you who are fathers that are in this room, family is everything. And I encourage you, don't let the years just keep going by not understanding your child because that's your child. And for those of you who are the children of people who are same gender loving, find your way to your son, to your daughter. Life is too short. Find your way. If your child is same gender loving, the likelihood is that you knew that way long before they did. I know my mother did. She finally told me that. She used to tell me, say, when I need to fix something, I'd always call you. I didn't call your brother. <laughs> she was trying to tell me something. Do you understand? <laughs> You've always been good with a hammer and a screwdriver, you bet. Always been good. She's trying to tell me that she understood who I was. Do you understand what I'm saying? And now I thank God that we had the chance that she did not go to heaven and she and I not have the chance to really walk hand in hand. Love covers everything. It is really all about love. It is really all about love. So I think it's important that you know that I had a contract for gospel music. I was gonna do a couple of solo albums. I've been uh, singing a long time. And my record company came to me and they said, okay, um, we, we wanna record you, but we need you to stop talking so much. <laughs> Why don't you just say that you love everyone and stop being so specific. <laughs> they even told me that they knew a lot of my sisters and brothers who are in gospel music are same gender loving people. How important is that, right? In fact, I'll go so far as to say I don't know that we would have any real good gospel music. I'm just saying. Okay. You feel me? Same gender loving people that were in gospel music. They asked me to, um, to stop talking. That's what they said, stop talking so much. And I said, well, I'm going to do it. I'm going to keep talking. And so we decided that we couldn't do a solo album. And I said, well, then that's it. And I said to God, so then what's next? And that was the impetus that got me involved in theological education. 
seriously involved. And that was like three degrees ago. I got addicted. <laughs> and I just love it. <laughs> because the truth sets you free. That's really the truth. But God knew. And that was the path. I still love to sing. I sing incessantly. But what is important is that I needed to do what I needed to do. Because I needed to know how best to rightly divide the very book that was sending so many of my people to hell, according to the church. And I needed to be able to come up with a theology of radical inclusivity. And it is at the conjunction, everybody understand me? of when a group of people decide that they are not going to be taken away from their understanding of God. That is where liberation theology begins. So whether it's black liberation theology or womanist feminist liberation theology or LGBT liberation theology, there's somebody that says, you are not going to steal God from us. And I needed to be able to connect. And that's my story. So. And I thank God for it. I have no regrets. Thanks be to God. So, I'm going to give you a chance to have a little, just a little conversation. We've got like 10 minutes. How are we doing for time? Comments? Anybody? Who has a question or a oh, question? Yes. Mm hmm I just a week ago had uh, heard an, another African American woman speak um, very much about justice when it came to gender mm -hmm. and race, mm -hmm. but cannot get, or apparently at this point cannot get to the same place with human sexuality, and and I'm conflicted over what that means for me, what it means for my denomination. I'm United Methodist. Mm -hmm. We've got a lot going on with this. So I, and I don't even know if it's a question, but I, how two similar, I think you're probably about the same age, mm -hmm. um, can have just such, you know, is it, is it culture and is it faith? What is, what is this dichotomy and uh, what do we do about it? There's one thing that I would lift up, and that is that it is very difficult. It's the difference between sympathy and empathy. It is very difficult to put yourself in a person's reality. And I know people who fight hard. I, mean, I experience this in the UCC a lot. When I'm working with African Americans in the UCC, and we are down for each other as it relates to race, as it relates to you know, the prison industrial complex, you know, as it relates to food justice and food deserts in the inner city, we're down with each other. But when I'm working with straight people, it is very hard for them to embrace my realities as a same gender loving woman. And so, so here's my confession to you. In the denomination that I love, the United Church of Christ, there are times when I don't feel fully included in the LGBT movement, because it's predominantly white, or fully included in the black movement, because it's predominantly straight. So we had to make something of our own, if you understand. <laughs> we, had to, we had to come up with a way to connect. Now, your question is, it's incredibly important because we have an obligation to get under each other's load, even if it is not our lived experience. Mm. I don't set, I cannot set the majority population in this country free from getting under the load with me around racism in this country. Because you didn't choose your mom and daddy. Mm. I didn't choose mine either. But we have to get under each other's burden, each other's load, because tomorrow there may, some, may be something that is someone else's issue that has not been my experience. And I want to get under that load with them. We bear one another's burdens, sometimes by experience, and other times simply because justice requires it. I've never smoked crack in my life. And I minister to people all the time who are crack addicts, methamphetamine, they use Tina as they call it in the street. 
I do it all the time. I'm not going to smoke crack to know what crack is about. I need you to know that, brothers and sisters. <laughs> sister. I'm not going to go out here now <laughs> and get me a crack pipe. But I have to get close enough to it mm -hmm. to understand its pharmacology, to understand what it does psychiatrically, chemically, to the dopamine systems, inside the serotonin systems of people's bodies. I have to be able to know that if I'm gonna really be able to. So I gotta get close enough to it to understand it, even though I haven't had it as a lived experience, if I'm gonna help them. I hope that makes sense, and I encourage you. I love Virginia Ramey, Ramey Mollencott's book, Omnigender. I could talk a lot about a whole lot of books that are out there now. The seminaries are filled with them and the web, good old Amazon. <laughs> Yay, Bezos, I'm loving him today. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot that I could say about where you can go, but educate yourself about what creates human sexuality and where we are as a human family. That's what I say to people all the time, just like we talk about race. And we are obligated to bear one another's burdens. I believe that with my whole heart. Anybody else? Yes, Hi. First Hi. of all, thank you so much for being here tonight. This is, the, this is amazing. Thank you, sweetie. <laughs> thank you. Um, my question for you is, mm -hmm. um, as a queer person, yes. I have been sort of the victim of the Bible as a weapon. Say that again. The victim as, a, as a queer person, I have felt sort of the, the victim of people who use the Bible as a weapon yes. against me. Yes. And I have not yet found a way of combating that or resisting that that doesn't just turn into a fight of <laughs> like screaming or you know just creating a bigger divide and i'm wondering if you have any advice <laughs> or ways that you have maybe encountered to handle that um of course you know i've encountered a few times as you can imagine right i remember i was in a room full of uh, methodist pastors had, had asked me to come to talk to them about human sexuality. And so they were loaded for bear, if you understand what I'm saying. They had these big, big Bibles, and they had bookmarks all in the Bible. Now, when you, when you come into a room full of people with big Bibles and bookmarks, you know that they, so they had got the scriptures and they were ready. And that's, I mean, this is literally how they were, they're ready. And it was about 120 of them. Can you imagine that? So people warned me, said don't go, but I went anyway. And I said, well, I have one statement I want to make to you before we begin our conversation. I said, I am not a biblical literalist. So I said, it's going to be a real waste of time to proof text with me. Doesn't work. God bless Paul. <laughs> he, I think he needed therapy, but that's just my own strong feeling about it, <laughs> okay? <laughs> I love the book, I don't worship the book. I'm not a bibliolatrist, Peter Gohm's word, you know? I don't worship the Bible, I worship the God that the Bible talks about, right? I believe in evolution, I believe in theological evolution, that's what I'm talking about, shifts and changes. In fact, what I believe today, I didn't believe 10 years ago. 20 years ago was even more complicated. Right? So we do evolve. I said, so I just need to kind of begin there with you all. Now go ahead. What are your questions? If you understand what I'm saying. I said, well, if you can't proof text, if I can't, if I can't read you a scripture and tell you that you're wrong, I don't have anything for you. That was basically what the rule. So, so it got down to, well, what do you believe? I said, oh, I got an opportunity to say something to you now, right? Why do I, I began there because that is my truth. And when people come for you with the text, it's usually people who have not really studied the text. They've just got the killer texts and pulled them out and they're gonna throw them at you. And most of the time they don't really understand contextually what they're saying. I mean, I could give you an answer, as can the web, frankly, for every one of the scriptures that are used to diminish you as a same gender loving person. But I would, I would say that you may not change their minds. 
because you tell them, you know, that I don't, I don't see it that way because they want you to see it that way, if you understand what I mean. And you may not change their minds. I would go all the way back around and say, you know what, I really don't really want to argue the text. It's just I want to tell you this. I love God and I'm loved by God. And the way God sees me, I'm complete, just as I am. And I love you, see you. Kisses, smooches. I mean, it's that kind of... <laughs> you, don't wanna, you don't wanna be pulled into a, a vortex that requires you to, to take the book to, to prove. Because when you get finished, there are things, as I said earlier, in the book for every hatred that exists on earth, but there are also things in the book for every kind of love that really should happen. It depends on your hermeneutic. If your lenses hate gay people, you'll find something. But if your lenses are lenses of love, you can go right back to the book and you will find love in the book. Where people need to be healed is in their hermeneutic, do you understand? When your heart stops hating, you don't find hate. When your heart starts loving, you do find love. That's where you are in the relationship with God. Stand strong in that. You have nothing to prove. The best thing you can do is live a good life. Everybody that told me just about that I was going to hell is dead. <laughs> I didn't kill them. I just need you to know they're dead. <laughs> and if I had listened to them, I'd have ruined my whole life. And they'd still be dead. Bless their little hearts. And they went on, and some of them I preached their funerals and everything. <laughs> and it just is dead. And my whole, my whole existence would have been hindered. I'd have been living in a box, trying to prove something to somebody. God is greater than all the power of hatred. <laughs> Love trumps hatred every time. And I don't even like to use the word anymore because it's associated with somebody else. <laughs> but it is the truth, and it is my prayer for you. Yes? Is there anybody else before we leave here tonight? Um, I, I just want to say um, I promise that before March ends, we will offer a biblical self-defense workshop. Um, mm -hmm. It's a workshop that I've been doing for about 12 years. We always do it at Pride. Sometimes we do it in the middle of the year. Good. Sounds like it's good to do that. So um, we'll offer one of those and we'll we'll put information on the event Facebook page. Sure, that's a good way to, to good. advertise that. I like it. Great. Who else has a question? Anybody else? It's okay. Yes, I do. <laughs> this has really been a rich evening. Thank, thank you so God. much. Thank you, brother. And thank you for sharing. I'm sitting here thinking you're really smart. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, brother. And in my world, there's not very many smart people. <laughs> And I'm trying to figure out how I go from the deep and rich sense of how you use these texts, how you use your life, how you witness. In, I don't live in a seminary. Mm -hmm. I live in a different kind of a place, and I'm struggling with that. Thank you for your transparency, and thank you for probably naming what is in the hearts of people who feel like we have to have a response. And, and here's what I would like to say most to you, that much of what I have been able to distill in words was first distilled in my heart mm. without words. I call it the, the knowing. Even when you can't explain the knowing, our relationship with God is based on, our relationship with good, with life, is based on knowing. Not so much articulating knowing, or being able to tell people in all these words that perhaps I gathered along the way <laughs> in my education, but I knew before I went to school. I just didn't know how to say what I know. That's the power of our freedom when we evolve theologically is that we know 
And I say it this way, if all the books burned, if there was nothing to refer to, what do you know? And it's the knowing that really makes the difference. It's not the smart, it's the knowing. And I don't consider my, I know some brilliant people. You know what I mean? <laughs> I do pretty good. But I know some folks that's like, whoo, they got that Hebrew down and that Greek down. You ought to hear them. Ooh, they just carry on. It's just fierce. But I do know. And knowing is relational. I invite you to work even harder at being a friend of God. Get closer. When you have a friend, you talk to him. Glory to God. All by myself, I talk. Hallelujah. I told you I had Pentecostal moments. <laughs> like God is there, because God is there. It's in the knowing. And you can say more with your knowing oftentimes than you can with your words. B, can I say it this way? Jesus, when the telling of the, when, when he went back to Nazareth, you know, he had a home synagogue in Nazareth that he was faithful to. And after he came out of the wilderness, being tempted of the devil, as the text says, he went back to his home and he went to the synagogue and he stood with the men and read from the scroll of Isaiah. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. You all know that passage. When he got finished, the text says that he closed the book and he sat down and he said to the people, paraphrase, today, this word is made manifest in me. That's what he said. Essentially, he said, I used to just read the book, but today I've decided to be the book. <laughs> uh oh. See, that, that makes the Pentecostal want to run, in case you want to. <laughs> I just want to take off down the aisle thinking about it, right? <laughs> Here is the charge to us. You don't have to know verse in scripture line upon line. The word of God, the logos of God, the essence of God is made flesh in you. It's in you. And if you can just be and fully be and not allow anyone to trick you into being something other than who you really are, be the book so that people can read the authenticity in your life. That is the greatest testimony that we could ever, ever, ever give to the people that surround us. Don't fake and phony for anybody. Make water rise up to your level. Anybody feel what I'm saying? <laughs> Make it rise up to your level. Have confidence that you were sent out of eternity into time for a purpose. You, God knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb, which means you pre-existed your birth in spirit, and now you're here on assignment, on a work visa. <laughs> and that means you have everything you need to do what you were sent here to do. I feel your heart. And where you may feel diminished sometime, and I know what that feels like as a human being, you have limitless opportunity because greater is God is in you. Hallelujah. Than anything that is in the world. We got good work to do, and there are enough of us in this room to change the world. I believe it with my whole heart. God bless. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.